doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor. What I would like to do next is introduce Hubert Danso. Um, Hubert is the CEO and Chair of Africa Investor, a pan-African infrastructure investment holding company um, for institutional investors. He's also Chair of the CFA New York Society Global Asset Owners Advisory Council and Chair of the African Sovereign Wealth and Pension Fund Leaders Forum. Hubert, it's fantastic to, to see you. Again, last time we met was in Glasgow during COP26. That's right. I'd love to get your assessment of the outcome. So particularly thinking of that perspective as a global asset owner. Right. Well, first of all, it's a great pleasure to uh, be back again. I think around this time last year, I was... Uh, participating in the A4S summit. And, and indeed, we had a, you know, a, a very dynamic and active participation um, in Glasgow. Um, but you know, just to respond to your, your question, firstly, I think that congratulations are in order to the British government and the UN uh, FCCC Secretariat, um, just simply recognizing that it's very difficult to host a summit of that stature and complexity uh, during a pandemic and deliver some, some notable uh, progress. I mean, we've never really seen a COP summit that's been so heavily anticipated globally or, or global awareness of the need for uh, such a high ambition uh, so evident. Um, but clearly, genuine urgency and a willingness to match the words with action and to close that sort of gap between pledges and detailed short-term plans we feel is still, still missing. Um, the participation of the finance community and the finance track, we believe, was historic and, and particularly positive. Um, but there's no question that the required quantums um, of finance are, and capital are, are certainly within reach coming out of that uh, finance track. Um, you know, that, that capital is really there to be able to accomplish and deliver the net zero. Um, you know, we also believe that the, the you know, UN setting up a net zero panel for non-state actors where business will play a, a major role is very important and we welcome that. Um, but of course, the, the obvious and the biggest issue we anticipated and were not surprised by the outcome, uh, unfortunately, was the broken promises and the eroded trust regarding the just transitions, adaption and mitigation finance pledges, which are effectively asking Africa, which represents uh, what only three to four percent of cumulative global CO2 emissions to forego the development of our 15.2 trillion uh, proven fossil fuel reserves and resource endowment which incidentally does not take account of the fact that only half of the continent has been geologically explored and tested. Um, and estimates are that the continent has at least the same resources today um, that have been unexplored um, that it actually has as proven resources. So that's at least another 15 trillion that could be available for the continent's uh, economic and uh, social development. So the continent in many respects, uh, as we saw and we all witnessed, is being cajoled uh, for all the right reasons, of course, uh, to forego this 15 to 30 trillion um, asset um, uh, in return for a share of a not delivered 100 billion per annum high vintage adaption and mitigation broken promise. So we really do believe that trust needs to be focused and restored uh, by advanced nations honoring and increasing their pledges um, because this 100 billion that we, that we keep sort of referring to, the UN came out and very clearly stated that that should actually be between 300 to 500 billion per annum, depending on when it's actually uh, received. So whilst we recognize that doubling adaption finance by sort of 2025 um, is on the table, we certainly see that as only you know, a very small step in the right direction. Uh, and finally, we do you know, solemnly believe that the goal to limit uh, global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, will remain in reach if finance can be mobilized at unprecedented scale uh, to speed decarbonization in emerging markets. I'd love to pick up on that point that you raised, because as you say, the, the, the questions around just transition and that need for both resilience and um, solutions that are going to be economically, socially viable, it really, really does come to a head in, in a, a continent like Africa, which is experiencing some of those real frontline impacts of climate change already and yes. we know that that's going to get worse but then as you say also um 
a need for for economic development, um, social development. In terms of the work that you do at, at Africa Investor, do you, can you see some of those solutions? I'd love to hear, you know, what are the what are the practical actions, particularly for the finance community, that they could be taking that that helps to find a just transition um, and and some of those solutions. Absolutely. No, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Jessica. Look, ensuring resilience and delivering a post-pandemic economic recovery plan for the continent is a top uh, African Union priority. And the newly launched uh, $3.2 trillion African continental free trade area, which is essentially the largest free trade area since the establishment of the World Trade Organization, is seen as a key vehicle to accomplish not only the resilience uh, dynamic, uh, but also net zero and scope three emission reductions. As you know, 70% of emissions come from industry and the private sector. However, whilst approximately, what, 35 countries on the continent have made commitments towards net zero emissions, uh, in the absence of uh, taking receipt of that back to the same, uh, you know, promised adaption and mitigation finance, it's gonna be pretty challenging to actually meet our NDC commitments um, of, you know, which sort of total around three trillion, uh, which is going to be required to, you know, support our transition, um, you know, by 2050. And, and, and it's really unaffordable for most, if not all uh, African uh, countries. You know, in addition, you've got the sort of the complex nature of the logistics of our transition and the continent's base load power needs to consistently, not intermittently, keep our economy's lights on, so to speak. Um, you know, that really needs to be appreciated, understood, carefully managed, and we believe adequately uh, resourced. The reality is we have to really roll up our sleeves as the asset owner community and actually work with governments to determine what is bankable, what's investable, and what our mandates won't allow us to participate in. You know, as we know, just in terms of the, the three trillion, it shouldn't be so daunting because Africa possesses an astonishing technical wind potential of almost 180,000 terawatt hours. Uh, each year, which is enough to satisfy the entire continent's electricity demands 250 times over. So we believe at the African Green Infrastructure Investment Bank platform, we will ensure that each project and each portfolio as a whole will enable us to really align with those needs and, and that opportunity pool. Um, and again, we'll be able to just draw you know, very good collaborations with uh, both global as well as institutional um, investment partners who really want to get exposure to the market, but, you know, need assistance in being able to understand the risks and align with uh, partners and, and peers um, who share the same uh, values. So looking ahead to next year, I mean, it, that, I think that there's a huge amount of, um, of opportunity, as you've highlighted there, and, and need to, to accelerate some of those capital flows. COP27 is being hosted by Egypt, so one year's time. What is, is, are there one or two actions that you would really like to see um, over the coming year with that focus on COP27? Well, I think the, the, the you know, as you know, the, the, the outcome document from COP26 uh, called on every country to basically present stronger national action plans and NDCs in the run up to, to COP27. So we, we think that there's a lot that needs to be done and it's absolutely crucial for governments to raise their ambition um, of their NDCs uh, before COP27. And we also think it's going to be essential to be really putting in place some of those monitoring um, uh, mechanisms to actually see that the, the pledges made at, at COP26, you know, are actually delivered by, 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 by the governments. We'd love to see uh, and we hope to see the just transition issue and the adaption and the mitigation finance firmly on the COP27 as opposed to the COP28 um, agenda. Uh, you know, we think that that is going to be a, a, a fundamental need and requirement. Um, and, you know, so we would really like to see a lot of, um, uh, you know, collaborative work. Um, there's no need to delay that any further, considering it being the Achilles heel of the overall agreement and its implementation. So, uh, you know, that's really what we're going to be looking for. But we're going to be building on all of the great progress, particularly the finance uh, community's progress, um, you know, the net zero um, focus that, you know, was delivered by the GFANS and, and the Sustainable Markets Initiative and, and your good work at uh, A4S. We're looking to build on that. Uh, and we think that that gives us, um, you know, sufficient hope uh, to ensure that we can actually get the types of de-risking that we need to see 
Fantastic. Well, I think we're, sadly, we're out of time, Hubert. We could have carried on for, I think, probably several hours, but okay. thank you so much for sharing those real insights. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think some, some really important perspectives to be coming back to, which I'm sure we will be over the course of the coming year. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.